Let me start with a bold statement. We are not living in the country that most of us are trained to think we live in. It's important to clear this up. This lesson looks at the pieces of American history that historians have ignored, probably because they don't understand the monetary system. This system has converted us into a financial empire. American history suggests we started a country on free principles that last to this day, where the population rules. But if that's the case, why do both political parties constantly do things that a massive majority of the people don't want? This lesson explains why. The original power structure in the Republic is diagrammed here, with the states voluntarily organized around a central governing document. The states are drawn as pyramids for a deliberate reason. A pyramid represents an economic engine and growth potential, and political and social power. Each state had its own ruling class, merchant class, and working class. States had their own banks, main street businesses, and towns and neighborhoods where people exerted power together in local communities. The point is that the states were autonomous units, and political power and economic growth engine were not at the federal level. This was a good mix between Jeffersonian ideals and Hamiltonian principles. Jefferson represented what I'll call horizontal forces. He was from rural, agrarian interests and wanted to keep power distributed so that horizontal relationships between people and local community would be the basis for bottom-up power in the republic. Hamilton represented vertical forces. He was connected with wealthy urban interests and wanted power and wealth to be able to consolidate vertically to drive economic growth. Then after the Civil War, the power structure shifted. States were then explicitly put under the federal level government in terms of political power. And then in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created, which, as people warned at the time, would be a dramatic, fundamental change in the character of the United States, where economic power shifted from the states to the federal level. This was the seed of the American financial empire. It was the head of a new potential pyramid that would encompass everything by putting everything else in debt. And the Federal Reserve is actually just a cartel of private banks, working with governmental license to control all money in the country. It's a public-private partnership which established the most powerful monopoly in history, typically called Wall Street. Shown here with the requisite American flag behind it because Wall Street loves to associate itself with the idea of American freedom. But Americans are generally opposed to cartels and monopolies because, by definition, they violate the free market and they have nothing to do with freedom. For example, we don't like OPEC, but we seem to have no problem with the Wall Street cartel. And this brings us to the first key flaw of neoclassical economics, which has really become a religion. It calls our system under a privately controlled monopoly a free market. Not even close. Macroeconomics is completely monopolized. We'll cover many more flaws over the rest of this course, but the primary one is this issue of money monopoly. Now, This monopoly even gave the primary banks power over the states and the federal government because the Federal Reserve Act even made them dependent on money from the banks. This marked the death of Thomas Jefferson and the balance between horizontal and vertical forces. The height of this new pyramid was so massive that Hamiltonian vertical forces would be allowed to completely dominate. We'll see in the next lesson more about this, but at this point, it just means allowing wealth and power to consolidate into the hands of a few. Now, also in 1913, the IRS was created as a key component of driving these vertical forces. The IRS does not exist primarily to fund, to fund your kid's school lunch program or whatever else we may think from watching the evening news. Instead, it exists to fund the banking cartel, as you'll see in a minute. So at this point, a very powerful vertical machine had been built, and it's pictured on this screen. Then in the 30s, the Great Depression effectively chopped states off the knees and made them smaller in terms of power and autonomy. It also made we the people smaller, as everybody was poorer. So everything at this point was entirely dependent on the banking cartel because the government itself couldn't even issue money anymore. So this was the point uh, to crank this new debt machine into high gear. The banks pumped out debt, cycled it through the states, and the value plus interest was fed back up to the top by the IRS and the legal system, which still today serves the banks. After a few generations of repeatedly cycling debt and actively changing our laws to break down state power and boundaries to corporate expansion, the country was completely changed into something that looks like this. This is a corporate overlay that operates almost everything in the U.S. as one integrated system. What's reflected in the pyramid is power. That's the vertical axis. Each layer has more power than the layer under it. The first thing to notice is that the Constitution no longer appears here, and neither do the states, at least as separate autonomous units. Instead, all power in the system is driven by the dollar. It aligns everything in the pyramid. It does this because it actually is not a sovereign U.S. dollar, but it's instead a debt instrument of the Federal Reserve. 
This surprises some people because the dollar is just something that sort of pumps out of ATM machines as if it's part of nature. But, of course, it's not. It's man-made product, managed by people just like any other corporate product. And those people are who I've labeled owners at the top. Now, this might sound really odd because we are trained to think we live in a free democracy. I'll more fully explain this in other lessons, so please hang with me for a while if you don't believe it. At this point, I'm just talking about the people who created the original Empire Seed back in 1913 and still control it today. And the Fed is at the top of the pyramid because it's the corporation that manages the product. Most of the dollars it manages aren't actual dollar bills, but instead electronic digits sitting in your bank. So the banks are next in this pyramid. They're dependent on the Fed's monetary and regulatory decisions, so they're below it in terms of power. But of course, since the Fed's just a cartel of these banks, uh, the power hierarchy is murky to say the least. But the banks are above everything else because they effectively govern the rest of the system by running the debt machine. So the multinational corporations form under the banks. They are the primary customers of the elite banks. They're dependent on them. They have to report to them every three months. They take bank credit, funnel it through their machines, and then pass it back up to the banks. You can kind of think of the Wall Street banks as modern-day feudal lords and the multinational corporations as their feudal knights out conquering more territory. Then below this middle layer are the layers of the old republic that don't really matter to this new empire. And they'll be continually squeezed out of existence as a simple result of the math of debt-based money. The states are now just administrative districts, and they're all now virtually bankrupt as a result of being subjugated to this machine. Community banks and state banks... Main Street businesses, and small farmers, mom and pop shops, these are all being squeezed as well since the big banks get virtually free money from the Fed so they can pump out mega levels of debt to the multinationals and gobble up territory. And then below that level is all of us. All the people working for a wage, consuming products, paying debt and taxes. We actually create all the value in the system, all the individual people do, and that value is then mined by the top and passed back up via the IRS and the legal system which serves the banks. This is the key to the power of this system. This is why the American empire became the sole global superpower, because we Americans voluntarily let our value creation be stripped quite aggressively so that it can be handed over to the rich institutions that hold our debt and then keep cycling back through the system. This middle layer has come to be called too big to fail. It's a phrase we've heard in the news, and it's become generally accepted among Ivy League economists. But it's actually just an Ivy League ruse. The idea that we need these large institutions in order for us to continue living is absurd. Too big to fail is actually a doctrine that attempts to justify transferring wealth and value from the bottom layers, like all the people, the states, and the biz local businesses, and passing it up to these upper layers in order to keep this system intact. Natural forces would ebb and flow, cycling back and forth to keep power from consolidating at the top. But too big to fail trumps those natural cycles by using the force of the U.S. government to extract value from the smalls at the bottom and handing it over to these bigs in the middle of the pyramid. This is the proper way to interpret what the government has done in response to the crash of 2008. And that's the role of the U.S. government in this system. It actually isn't in the pyramid because it's really not our government anymore. Rather, we're governed day to day by this debt system, the banks, and the corporations. The government's just there to mop up these lower layers and make sure they play the role they're supposed to play. The big business interests at the top of the pyramid could not exist without government doing this for them. It's the only way to keep this pyramid intact. Now why does the government do it? Well, it's in debt and therefore controlled by the banking system as well. It's not a sovereign government because it can't issue its own money. A government that's inferior to a bank is not sovereign. And that brings us to the end of the first lesson where we've covered the, con the conversion of this constitutional republic into the post-war republic then to the monolithic 20th century debt machine, and finally to today's completed top-down financial empire. As I said at the beginning, if you continue to believe you live in a free republic, you'll be constantly frustrated. This more complete version of American history hopefully clears things up. It's unfortunately missed by historians in our textbooks because apparently historians don't understand money, as almost nobody does. So now let's dig into money in more detail. You may not believe the issue of empire yet because they're based on top-down control. In the past, emperors have used militaries and weird people in weird costumes on horses called knights to exert their power. A lesson two shows how debt and debt-based money is the basis for top-down control in our empire.